Good morning. I have with me uh, Kevin Noblock. Uh, good morning, Kevin. How are you from Anbaric? Uh, good morning, Norman. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's great to see you again. And, you know, as we were discussing, it'd be good if we could see each other in person, but this is pretty good. So thanks so much. Of hey, course. listen, I have a couple of questions for you. I wanted to go through. Just tell us a little bit about Anbaric. Um, you know, your, your New York, New Jersey ocean grid project in the southern New England ocean grid project are really among the most interesting and largest wind projects uh, in the U.S. Can you just tell us about, a little bit about those projects? Yes, indeed. Well, Embarek is uh, an independent transmission developer. Uh, over the years, it's been around about 15 years. It was founded uh, by Ed Kraples. Uh, and uh, uh, the company has built uh, two large, uh, co-developed, two large uh, transmission projects in New York and New Jersey, the Hudson and the Neptune projects. Um, both projects were, were complex. They involved uh, bearing cable in the seabed and, and on-land transmission development. Both were developed on time and on budget. And uh, now Embarek's focus is to help deploy renewable energy. And in particular, we're focused on offshore wind uh, transmission, uh, energy storage, and then also uh, onshore, more traditional transmission projects, as uh, uh, each of the key states that we're active in uh, have, have very ambitious goals to build out renewable energy. Uh, the, the, the New York, New Jersey ocean grid project and the uh, Southern New England ocean grid project are, are, are projects that we have designed to uh, uh, develop an offshore transmission grid in a much more efficient way than some of the early projects are doing with their gen, gen lead lines, their individual uh, wind farm cables running to shore. Uh, we have applications before the uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management at the Department of Energy, excuse me, at the Department of Interior uh, uh, for a right of way, right of use to run those cables and uh, people can can find those projects online on our own website or or, or on on the BOEM website. Uh, the, those those applications are going through the permitting process as we speak. But the basic idea is to take a planned approach to building an offshore wind transmission grid and do it in a way that minimizes impacts on fisheries uh, and on uh, endangered marine species, uh, that minimizes the infrastructure in the water. Uh, lessens the impact on ratepayers, and, uh, and, and assures the success and the growth of the offshore wind industry by getting uh, 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 the significant new clean energy to our, our cities and our factories and our, our businesses and homes. Now, it's really a, a fantastic project. It's, you know, we obviously named you guys one of the 10 best projects in the U.S. a year ago. And it's, it's a visionary project. It, it motivates people. And I think it especially motivates the younger generation, very concerned about uh, green energy. What's your timetable, uh, Kevin? You know, large projects like this are, are pretty common in Europe, less common in the U.S. So what do you see as your timetable? Well, the timetable is now. It's, it's a little complicated because it's dependent on both federal permitting and on, on the procurement uh, processes of the of the relevant states, so New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island. In this case, uh, the, uh, the the governors and the states up and down the Eastern Seaboard have have committed to 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy. Uh, to put that into perspective, uh, Norman, that's the equivalent of 30 average size nuclear reactors. That's a lot of energy up really? and down the coast. Uh, Department of Energy says we have the capacity to uh, to build 80 uh, gigawatts and more of offshore wind on the eastern seaboard alone, not not yet factoring in the west coast. Uh, so that's that's a lot of energy. The states so far have um, issued awards for offshore wind farms that bundle transmission and generation, and as I say, allow these direct cables to shore. Okay. But an increasing chorus of voices, including from the wind generators and from for many others, are calling for a, a planned approach to this grid, this offshore grid. And that's where our ocean grids concepts come in, because we're, we're offering uh, a very concrete approach where uh, we would site 
offshore uh, collector platforms, or uh, in our case, uh, HVDC converter right. stations offshore, 15, 20 miles offshore, adjacent to some of these wind energy area leases that the Department of Interior has, has, have, has leased out, uh, where these wind farms can tie in and then you run uh, fewer cables to shore, these, these uh, high voltage direct current cables, and you, you're, you're selective about which onshore substations to tie into. You find the ones that, that through analysis, as we have done, that you can connect to efficiently with, with uh, the fewest uh, costly upgrades. So uh, what we need in this equation is for the states to move from these individual projects uh, to, uh, to a more of a planned approach. And that, that's what actually happened very recently in, in New Jersey, where the uh, New Jersey uh, Board of Public Utilities asked PJM to conduct a transmission, an offshore wind transmission procurement. Uh, and, and that's very exciting because it's in that context that our project uh, can compete and potentially uh, uh, win the right to build. That's great. Yeah, I saw that. It was, it was sort of New Jersey is first. That was, a, that was great. I saw that on, I think, LinkedIn. Um, listen, you're the president now. Uh, for federal policy for Anbar, uh, recently, until recently, you were the, the president of New York, New Jersey Ocean Grid. What are you hoping that uh, President-elect Biden and his team will do to boost the pro prospects of uh, U.S. offshore wind? Obviously, this is a big priority for the Biden administration. And, of course, the president-elect is from one of the states that you'd end up serving. So really interesting to get a sense of how you see uh, his administration. It's a very exciting moment uh, in that the president-elect uh, has, uh, as a matter of, of policy going into his presidency, the goal of decarbonizing the electricity sector by 2035. Very ambitious and appropriate to the, the climate change challenges we're facing. And in, in offshore wind, we have this exciting opportunity to create a brand new economic sector domestically from scratch. Uh, it's, it's underway, but it's, it's, it's in its, its infancy. And our ability to build this industry out along with, with, uh, with the, the uh, tens of thousands, maybe a couple hundred thousand jobs uh, when, when fully built out uh, uh, with the creating a new domestic supply chain of, of companies that can, can uh, provide the equipment and the services to this industry. Um, and many, many of those unionized jobs, uh, that, those are the stakes. That's what's, that's what's at stake. So it's, it's a big uh, uh, opportunity to contribute to rebuilding our economy uh, post-COVID uh, and to decarbonizing the electricity sector. So uh, there, there's, there's three areas of the federal government and the, the Biden-Harris administration can be, be helpful here to support this industry. Uh, the first is, is being clear on who's on first at the federal level. Uh, I mentioned Department of Interior a couple times, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. They have very clear statutory authority for the permitting of energy infrastructure in federal waters. Very critical, but a, a little narrow in terms of uh, it's not clear who at the federal level is responsible for the overall uh, planning of this offshore wind uh, transmission grid and the industry itself. Uh, the Department of Energy uh, and as, as you know, I was the chief of staff at the Department of Energy in the second Obama term, right. with Secretary Moniz, uh, has the overall responsibility for the integrity of the U.S. electricity grid. It has uh, deep experience in policy design. Uh, it has uh, the lead in the federal government on techn technology innovation with the national labs, with the applied energy programs and their, 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 their uh, R&D &D, uh, grant support. And so on. So my my view is that the Department of Energy uh, has a clear role here. Uh, it, I think this dates back to 2016. Then Energy Secretary Ernie Moniz, and then Interior Secretary Sally Jewell issued the first ever national offshore wind strategy, and that was that was very deliberate that those two agencies would join hands and and lay that out. And one of the first things that really should happen is that that should be updated and, and re reissued. Uh, secondly, the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management really needs to get back to, to regular order. 
the uh, the current Interior Secretary put the brakes on this industry, uh, 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 asking for a, 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 a a comprehensive environmental impact assessment, uh, which is was, was very good policy, uh, but in so doing really paused the permitting of the wind farms uh, that have received state awards. So, so if Boehm gets back to, to, to the regular order and, and moves forward with its responsibilities, that's a good thing. And then lastly, there, there, there is a need for some very targeted uh, uh, tax policy, extending the investment tax credit, uh, for offshore wind and for transmission, it doesn't apply to a transmission today, and uh, and and perhaps some targeted grants for for shipbuilding, port development, job training, and transmission planning. And what do you see in terms of the um, extension of the uh, of the tax credits? Is that what's the period that you're that makes sense? Well, if if you if you think about uh, the investment tax credit as applies to wind and solar generally. As you know, there was there was a there was kind of an agreement that it would be extended for five years and then phased out, and, and all of which happened. I think there was a one-year extension in there. The the case I think can be made that offshore wind is a newer industry and a newer piece of the puzzle, and really should uh, be extended an extension of the ITC for uh, you know somewhere between two and two and five years uh, would make good sense. There's a so-called safe harbor provision that that should be extended as well. Okay, that's really interesting because it's it's the kind of thing that would would release the kind of entrepreneurial activity that you're looking for. You you need some sort of predictability in terms of this business. Um, you know, on Bar, we, we touched on on this uh, a bit ago, Kevin, but. Could you elaborate a little bit? Umbaric has been effective, an effective proponent of taking a planned approach uh, to an open access offshore wind transmission grid. That seems to make a lot of sense. With a decision by the New Jersey BPU to ask uh, PJM to conduct just such a process, and now many other voices joining the chorus, it seems like your argument is prevailing. Is that is that true? Is Can you give us a little bit of a more color on that that issue. Yes, it it it, it is so, Norman. That you know, a, a year, eighteen months ago, we were one of only a few voices calling for for a planned approach. Um, we have the ability today. We know enough to take a step back to look at all these goals for offshore wind, to look at the existing onshore grid uh, uh, infrastructure, which ne was never built to anticipate. Uh, 30 gigawatts of new energy over right. over a less than two decade time span, uh, uh, much less, you know, significantly more than that. Um, and so uh, uh, the uh, uh, as I say, we started out, you know, one of the few lonely voices ca ca calling for this. And 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 part of the part of the rationale is that with uh, uh, broader competition, allowing transmission companies like ours to compete. With utilities, with wind generation developers, uh, that brings costs down. We've already seen competition bringing costs down in this industry, and and that allows us to to do more with with uh, less impact on ratepayers. Um, so, uh, fast forward to today, there was a, a, a technical conference that FERC held on offshore wind transmission uh, in October. Uh, it was actually. Uh, uh, we, we we had filed a complaint against PJM. Uh, we felt that they weren't they weren't treating us on the same footing as the generators when it came to offshore wind transmission and okay. and, and the connection. Uh, we we did not win that that appeal to FERC, but FERC said, you know what, Embarek, you you have raised a, a number of legitimate points. We're going to have a technical conference on offshore wind transmission and planning, and that happened in October. Uh, it was a day long, uh, three or four panels. And if you go back and, and look at those, uh, at, the, at the video of that, you'll see almost everybody, uh, all of those panels was calling for, for a planned approach and for a stronger role by FERC in working with the RTOs and the ISOs and the states to uh, to get us there. So it, it just makes all kinds of sense. And there's, there's no downside to it. Um, and what you're seeing first with New Jersey, um, uh, you're seeing in the other states some real, real uh, thoughtful approaches in New York State. Uh, they they've been conducting a so-called 270-day 
a comprehensive transmission study for renewable energy for both onshore and offshore. Uh, and uh, through legislation that Governor Cuomo signed last year on, on uh, renewable siting reform, uh, established a new bulk transmission priority process that is now underway with the, the New York PSC and, and, and NIPA. Uh, so uh, that's all very exciting. There's, there's, these, the, the states are, are, are basically developing formal processes to invite the best ideas from companies like ours, from, from the other actors, uh, and, and we're excited about where that's going to go. Yeah, we, we see this almost everywhere. Um, you're uh, not really a unique case. You're a, one of the more interesting cases, but technology is developing so rapidly uh, that it creates all sorts of opportunities to educate policymakers who wouldn't otherwise have access to this kind of information. So that's super interesting. And of course, you're a private investment uh, opportunity as well, which is really interesting from my point of view. It's phenomenal. That's a really good an important point, Norman. There's a lot of private capital that is eager to invest in this this offshore wind market and and, and energy storage, uh, which is a, a key a key uh, piece of of the puzzle to to ensure that we're we're not going to face congestion and curtailments with with, with offshore wind. Um, but you're absolutely right. I, our primary investor in Barrick is the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, and uh, uh, they own 40% of our company. They've set aside $2 billion to invest in projects that we develop. <clears throat> they're very, very bullish on this industry uh, and the potential, and they're not alone. There's a lot of private capital that wants to come in, and what it, it's, what that capital looks for is clear and consistent public policies uh, uh, that, uh, that that assure that there's there's uh, public support for this industry, uh, uh, and 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 that's what the the incoming administration uh, we we anticipate will 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 provide. Um, the, uh, the but but the key to this point is that 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 private investment really means that there's there's not a need for large investments you know from the federal government or, or the state. Some targeted funding, as I as I referred to, would would be helpful. But uh, so this is this is a a sector where the private sector can do the bulk of the lifting. It's fascinating. It really is interesting. Um, so how did you get here, Kevin? Tell us a little bit about your career. It's really interesting where you are right now. It'd be interesting for people to get a sense of how you get to where you are. Well, thank you, Norman. I mean, I, I started out as a newspaper journalist uh, <laughs> back in the late, late 70s, uh, coming out of undergrad. Um, and enjoyed that, but I, I got I, I did that for about five years, but I, I got a little antsy. I, I really wanted to kind of do as opposed to observe and report, uh, a little bit of a young man's, uh, uh, you know, a, a young man's uh, naivete. That is to say, journalists can be highly influential. But at the time, I, I wanted to get into the game, so I I um, uh, went to Washington in my mid twenties. I, I worked as a, a legislative aide first for uh, uh, the late Ted Weiss uh, from uh, Manhattan, <clears throat> and then I was. Uh, Went over to Tim Worth from Colorado when he was in the House in '85 as legislative director. Uh, Tim was running for the Senate in '86 for Gary Hart's seat and uh, won very narrowly, but he won and uh, asked me to come over to the Senate as his legislative director. Uh, and and that was terrific. Tim was in, there with Al Gore and John Kerry as as the uh, the early uh, visionary members of Congress, uh, understanding the threat of climate change and really advocating for for technological innovation to, to help help bring solutions uh, to uh, uh, to decarbonize. And so that was a wonderful experience. Um, I did a few other things along the way and uh, uh, found my way to the Union of Concerned Scientists, where I was the uh, number two for four years. And then in 2004, was was uh, the board asked me to be president. So I was president of the Union of Concerned Scientists for 10 years. Uh, and there was a, a marvelous chance also to continue to, to help design and, and advocate for uh, clean energy policies, uh, as well as nuclear security, which is a, a theme through my career, uh, uh, and science-based policy. Uh, so that, that I was very proud to have led, led uh, UCS for 10 years as president, and then had, in, in 2013, a chance to, to join the Obama administration. Uh, Secretary Moniz had just been confirmed in, um, 
in May of 2013, 97 to zero uh, in a very divided Senate, which was, was pretty impressive. And I, I came on board a month later as his chief of staff. And, oh. uh, and again, we had an almost four year run uh, right through uh, inauguration, uh, January 20th, 2017, where uh, in, in the, you'll recall in that second Obama term that the, the president said, let's let's get some work done on climate change and clean energy. So we had a very significant role on energy efficiency rules, on, on helping to advise on development of a clean power plan, on the vehicle fuel efficiency standards, on biomass, a, a whole, whole range of things, and, and played support on the on the, on the a supporting role on, on the Paris Agreement, um, and we and we we had a leading role in creating uh, mission innovation, where 25 countries plus the European Union all committed to increasing uh, very significantly their annual investments in clean energy technology. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, uh, so that's my that that's that's the background, and and uh, coming out of Department of Energy, I'd spent my entire career uh, in the public. And, and government and nonprofit spaces, and I really was convinced that that it was it was time for the private sector. There was tremendous opportunity for for the clean tech industry, the clean energy industry, uh, the big strategic corporations to uh, accelerate the deployment of, of of low carbon solutions. And I wanted to learn the business end of it. So I, I, uh, Ed Krapos gave me this wonderful opportunity to, to come in and, and develop uh, offshore wind transmission projects in in New York. That's phenomenal. It's, it's great talking to somebody who knows what they're talking about. That's a really interesting career. I hadn't realized that. So phenomenal. Thanks so much, Kevin. We're going to do another segment in a, in a bit on uh, Ed Kraples. You've mentioned Ed a couple of times, the founder of Onbarek. But I want to thank you so much for uh, participating uh, this morning. It's great to have a chance to see you again. And it's great to hear the Onbarek story, which is, I think, a phenomenal story. And critical to our future. Um, innovation, uh, private investment, uh, creativity, and persistence. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin. It's really wonderful. Well, thank you for having me, Norman. And thank you for your leadership on, on investing in infrastructure across the country. It is, it, it is uh, very, very critical and needed, and uh, you've been a very clear and, and, and persuasive voice. Well, thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you.